If you have your Bibles, turn them to Matthew 14. And this is going to be uh, now week number two of this prayer series we're on. I read a quote last week that no man or no woman and no church is greater than its prayer life. And so we are journeying to what does it mean to have a great prayer life. Because we're to be a great church, which I believe we are called. And in God's heart, we're a great church. We have to be a people of great prayer. So this is my effort to do just that. I talked about last week that prayer is a wilderness. It happens in a lonely place. It's you and the Lord alone. And in the wilderness, things you, we're, we're, we're baptized, in a sense, into uh, repentance. I talked about John the Baptist last week. He was in the wilderness, and then the word of the Lord came, and he had a message of the baptism of repentance. Repentance is to change the way you think. So something happens when you pray, and you immerse yourself into the presence of God in the prayer closet, that you actually begin to change the way that you think. It's an immersion into repentance, and when you change the way you think, Romans 12 says, we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So the fruit of that is actually transformation, um, and it happens in the mind. And so this week, I'm going to talk specifically, there's, there's multifaceted, many forms of prayer, but I'm going to talk specifically of the topic of thanksgiving and its relationship to prayer, and hopefully have a, a transformative understanding of what thanksgiving is. Uh, I was convicted, I'm going to read this, I wrote this down this Monday as I was praying about this week, and, and I wrote this. I said, I was convicted this morning that I have overlooked present blessing in the pursuit of the more of God. This has created a dynamic of always asking and always hungry, void of the peace and joy of grateful receiving. You've answered prayers for me that I've hardly thanked you for, and then I begin wanting more. I'm aware today that I need a fresh immersion into thanksgiving. I want to preface that. Keith actually came to me with a, with a good word during worship that uh, there is a holy and godly desperation and a holy and godly hunger that is pivotal and essential to the Christian life. And, and so I don't want you to take away that it's not. Um, but at the same time, we need to be thankful people. I'm going to start reading a few verses in Philippians, then we'll turn over to Matthew where you're at. But Philippians 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So there's a dynamic here. You pray and you, suppl you make supplication with thanksgiving. So even there it's tied. I'm going to read a few more verses, then I'll talk. Uh, down, if I skip a few, in this is now Philippians 4, uh, verses 10. He's talking about the provision. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly now that you've revived your concern for me. You were concerned for before but lacked opportunity. I don't speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I think there's a paradox right in that scripture that we miss sometimes. We like the script of verse 413, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's the one that even people that like aren't Christian, they're like, I'm going to get a tattoo. What is it? Philippians 413, I can do all things through Christ. I'm like, you don't even know what that means. It's like, it doesn't matter. It sounds cool, right? I'm not going to read that one. The secret of being filled and going hungry. There's a paradox here. There's a secret here. Paul's saying, I know how to be really hungry for God, and I also know how to be deeply satisfied. And I think that we all have to embody this tension here. Got to be filled and hungry. If we're only filled, we get really satisfied, complacent, content, and it's like, yeah, God, I'm good, just chilling. It's like Hawaii Christianity, just chilling. Everything's nice, right? And if I get too hungry, we start veering, and we're not thankful, we're not grateful, we're not satisfied. It starts becoming like, oh, please, God, like, please be with me. We're like, start begging God. We're begging him, begging him, and we can become like orphans uh, where, you know, orphans are like begging for food, where sons and daughters 
don't beg you. None of the parents in the room want their kids to come begging for food, right? And we can veer towards that if we're always hungry, if we lose this tension here. So I very much think there's a tension and a paradox contained within what a healthy, vibrant, and dynamic spirituality looks like. Um, I think that we all have a natural resting place in this tension, and I think it's because we need one another to kind of like ruffle each other's feathers. Like the people that really have a revelation of what it means to be satisfied and rest and filled kind of can ruffle the people that are like, I'm just hungry for more, more, right? And you're like, why are you screaming for more? Jesus is here, right? Like there's tension built within the body of Christ, okay? This is really good. This is really healthy. We're not all the same. For me, I know myself I will veer further and further and further and further into hunger. I'm afraid I'm going to trip over something. I'll get way over here where I am hungry for God. Like, but, but this is where the Lord's getting me just this week. Yeah, but you're not very thankful. And my blessings are actually becoming burdens because my blessings rest on a thankful heart. My, my blessings find rest on gratitude. There's two things. I've been praying for two things that are very near to my heart for years. Since I was in college, I remember praying for these two things. This year, both of them have happened. And the Lord was like, how much time have you spent thanking me? And I was like, oh my gosh. I probably have spent dozens and dozens of hours asking and contending for this in the hunger side. Then it happens. You know what I was praying? more <laughs> I want more now literally and I was like crap and literally I find that once I get into this place of thanksgiving start giving praise all of a sudden it's like I have this foundation within me that his blessings find rest because this is what I found even with this church as it's growing the blessings come it grows and guess I started finding myself full of anxiety well now I want more I want more I want more I want more and God's like Let's be really thankful for what you have. Let's learn to satisfy yourself. Okay? You following me? James 1.7 says this. It says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Paul says this in that same passage of Philippians. He says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. When we start dwelling on what God is doing, on what God is giving, when we start spending our time recognizing and pouring and finding, oh, this is noble, this is good, this is godly, this is honorable. If we start dwelling on the blessings, it will immediately start leading us to the giver who is the father of lights, where every good thing is coming down from. So gratitude isn't, it's not just good because, oh, I'm supposed to say thank you. It's good because it actually helps us connect with God. It helps us connect with where he is. A lot of people say, I don't know where God is. I say, well, where is the goodness in your life? Well, right here, 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 here. When you spend time getting, not just to like, thank you, God, Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my hairdresser. Thank you for my makeup. Um, okay, thank you for my shoes. Like my shoes. These are new. Super awesome. Thanks, God. All right, now I'm going to work. That's not Thanksgiving. When we get into the heart of Thanksgiving, it's like, thank you. Like, you answered this prayer, and you gave me this, and I have this, and I have a fan that spins above me at night, and it makes me cool so I can sleep and I have clean water, and I have a little microwave that I can click one, boop, and a minute later my food's prepared. For someone like me, that's a really big deal. Because <laughs> I'd probably starve <laughs> if I didn't have modern technology. Um, when you get into the heart of it, you will naturally, your inclination is you start connecting to the Father of Lights. You start becoming aware of God. That's what he's doing. That's where he is. So if the blessings come and we don't invest into thanksgiving and delighting ourselves in those, we're actually missing his invitation to come in to an experience of who he is as the father of lights, who gives everything good without variation or shifting shadow. You following me? This is super, super significant because thanksgiving brings increase to our lives. I'm going to say that again because that's a good word. Thanksgiving brings increase to our lives. So if you got Matthew 14, 
We're going to read verse, start at verse 13, and we're going to read actually verse 15, second that, and we're going to read a very, very familiar passage. This is Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. So who knows how many people? More than 5,000. Verse 15, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking toward heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over, and it was 12 baskets full of bread. What's the point here? There's two groups of people, the disciples And then there's Jesus, and they have the exact same situation, the exact same provision, but there are two very radical different perspectives and responses that take place. The disciples are sitting here seeing, okay, I see all these people, maybe five, six, seven, eight thousand. I'm not really sure, but a lot, right? So they're looking at all the need, and then they say, okay, we got five loaves, and we've got two fish. They didn't even look at the five loaves and the two fish. They were looking at 5,000 hungry people. So they were looking at the lack. They were looking at what God wasn't doing. They were looking at what God hadn't given, right? But Jesus says, what do you have? What do you have? And I think that's a really good question that I hope kind of hits us tonight. What do you have? They go, five loaves, two fish. He goes, give them to me. Because Jesus wasn't focused on what was lacking. Jesus was focusing Focused. Foking? I made that up. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> that was really close to really bad, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Be destroying that little digital recording if that would have taken place. Uh, Jesus wasn't focused on what wasn't happening. Jesus was focused on what the provision was, on what had come down from the Father of lights with whom there's no shifting shadow or variation. He was focused on the provision of heaven. He gets these five loaves and these two fish, which, yeah, it doesn't look like a lot, but that's not kingdom thinking. We're getting transformed here. Five loaves and two fish, and he looks up to heaven because every good gift comes from above, right? And who is this God Who is this father? He is the Lord who provides for his people. So he's seeing the provision. He looks up to heaven. He's blessing it. He's giving thanks. I think in Luke it says, and he gives thanks. Thank you, God. My promises aren't circumstantial. They're relational. I don't need to look to all my circumstances to know if God's promise is going to be fulfilled because he's the God of the impossible. I just need to know who he is. Gives thanks, breaks it, and somehow five loaves and two fish feed 5,000. Whoa. Thanksgiving multiplies things. You know what's crazy about the kingdom? They don't do addition in the kingdom. They do multiplication. You know there's only one number that you can't multiply? Zero. So what what is this fallen fleshly perspective always want us to get focused on? What's not happening? There's 5,000 people, Jesus. They are so hungry. There's so much need. What are we ever going to do? She's like, get your eyes off what's not happening. Get your eyes onto what is happening. People say, man, Prayer is so dry for me. It's dry. The Bible's so dry. It's like a desert. I can't even connect. Just not feeling it, Pastor. I think you're focused on the wrong thing. What is God doing? What is he doing in your prayer? What are you feeling that's good? What do you have in your life that's happening? We always have something to be thankful for. That's the crazy thing. Always. If you don't believe me, Come with me next time to India, and you'll see just how many things 
you have to be thankful for? What would it look like if instead of getting into prayer about what we're supposed to pray to God or ask him for, we spent time just getting into the heart of what is he doing? Well, there's a storm in my life, and it's raging everywhere. There's just winds and waves, and it's crazy, and relationships, and work sucks, man, and I don't even know what to do. It just, it just sucks. Everything sucks. I'm just, I can't sleep at night. My back hurts. I, duh, God, help me. Uh, yeah, prayer sucks. I don't know why. What is God doing? Well, when I wake up in the morning, for some reason, I feel peace for like five minutes. Then I get going and it leaves. Wait, 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 what? You had peace for five minutes? Yeah? Where did that come from? Well, I don't know. I didn't think about that. Just thought I just felt peaceful. No, no, no. Where's your provision? Oh, peace. Jesus, thank you for peace. Whoa, it's more. It's growing. Something's happening. Whoa, I start feeling anxious all of a sudden in the same situation at work, and I take a step back, and I say, wait, wait, there's peace, right? And I start focusing, where's my provision? Where is God moving? What is he doing? Because he's always doing something, and it's always good. Always. And he increases. He's the God of the impossible. He can increase something into nothing, or something into great, right? He can feed 5,000 with five fish, five loaves, whatever. Same thing. Okay, this is, this is big stuff. We, we, we will lack experiences in worship. We will lack experiences in prayer. We will lack experiences with God. We will, lack, we will lose all kinds of joy in our life because we're not just investing into gratitude and recognizing, learning the art, learning the discipline of recognizing the provision of God coming into our lives. We have to learn to recognize the provision. Once we do that, we'll know how to increase it. Once we increase it, we'll see things start happening in our world. World, right? So I'm going to take us through a story. Take it, turn your Bible to 1 Kings. I'm going to look at an awesome Bible story of a, a man named Elijah who went on a journey with God into the wilderness, into alone with God, into the prayer closet to say, learning how to recognize the provision of heaven. So we'll just start 17. This is 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. 1 Kings is like the middle of the Old Testament, probably the beginning of the Old Testament. So if you've hit like Psalms, go left. If you're at Genesis, go right. Good luck. If you have an iPhone, type in 1 Kings. <laughs> now Elijah the Tishbite who was of the setters of Gilead, he said to Ahab, who is a wicked, powerful king, says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. First James, actually James 5, says that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Okay, I just read you a story about Jesus multiplying bread, right? You say, that's awesome. He's Jesus. Now we're talking about Elijah. We're talking about a man with a nature like ours. It says when he prayed, the rain stopped. When he prayed again, the rains came. But Elijah, I'm going to demonstrate here in the next few verses, prays and thinks differently than we do. But he is still a man with a nature like ours. So I want this to be a inspiration for what, how transformed you can become in your thinking, for how transformed you can become in your praying. Because God doesn't want to just use you to do little things in your life. He wants to use you to bring change to nations. Amen? He's a man with a nature like ours. And we're going to watch what the Lord does through taking him to the wilderness and taking him and teaching him how to pray. So it says, so he gives this, this huge prophecy to the king. It says it's not going to rain for three and a half years, except in my word. Whoa, boom. That's pretty powerful. It'd be like going to Donald Trump saying the economy's going to crash Three and a half years, nothing's changed until I say something. See ya, right? It'd be like pretty scary. We read this like, oh, that's so normal. There's nothing normal about this. That's terrifying. Verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. 
So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the book, from the <laughs> living water from the book. It's prophetic. It's joking. From the brook. You think, okay, he does this huge act of obedience, prophesies to this king, and what does he get? He gets told to go to the east of the Jordan. You know what that is? The wilderness. Right? If you go to Israel today, east of the Jordan, it is like rolling crazy desert. You would not want to go there. It doesn't say just go there. He says go. You're going to find in other translations, it says the Kareth Ravine. Kareth literally means cutting, scourging, separating. It's a place where, of sanctification, where you're separating the spirit from the flesh. You're getting the old mindsets out. The Lord is doing a work in his prophet in training. So he says, go to the wilderness and hide yourself in the Kareth Ravine. Get down there in that isolated place where nobody else is going to see you and nobody else is going to find you. You're going to drink the water, and this is how I'm going to provide for you. Nasty little birds called ravens are going to bring you food and drop it off twice a day. Okay. So you get there, I'm sure it's cool for like two days, three days. This is awesome. Seven days, this food tastes the same. Fourteen days, ugh, ugh. I went to the cafeteria in school, like fourth year, my senior year. I was like, I can't even eat this food anymore. It's so disgusting, and I have like 35 options. No, it's just meat and bread and water. And I'm sure Elijah, you know, it sounds kind of cool in the Bible, but this is like pretty miserable. Wouldn't you agree? And you can't, like, control. You know, our natural propensity when it comes to provision is we kind of want to, like, control. I want to know, how do I know that raven's coming back tonight? How do I know? You know what I mean? Like, no. It's like God saying, I'm going to provide for you, and you're going to have a choice, Elijah. You're either going to have to focus on my provision and stay here in this place, in this lonely place with me, and focus on what I am doing, or you're going to be insane. Gotcha. Who's felt that before? God's like, I got you right where I want you. You don't focus on me, you're going to lose your marbles. Because nothing's working like it used to. Right? Who can attest to that? I've been there. That's why I learned to pray. (laughs) So he puts Elijah in this place. He's like, okay, I'm going to break you. I'm going to cut you. I'm going to pull this stuff away so that all you're able to do is be so consumed with what I'm doing that nothing else matters anymore. And in this quiet, lonely, broken place, God does a great work of transformation. It's in the private place. It's the private place that prepares us for public use. Right? If we do not learn and go and sit in the prayer closet... In the, in, the, in, the, in the lonely place where nobody else is, there's a work, a deep work of transformation that takes place there that will not happen anywhere else. And it is the very preparation for the public use, for the, for the stepping in to the calling that God has for us. And God does it with his prophet. Right? And, and I, can, I can relate. I, was, I, was, I felt like the Lord told me to share this story as I was in preparation this week. And I was actually in the Israeli uh, wilderness for a season of my life. It was funny. Uh, the Lord told me to take a semester off school and go to Israel. I thought it would be awesome. I thought it would be like the most amazing, cool, you know, whatever experience in my life. And it was a wilderness. And literally, I was me and my brother alone. There were times when the Lord said, I want you to literally fast and go and sleep in the wilderness. My mom didn't like that very much, but we told her afterwards. So what mama doesn't know can't hurt mama. So uh, literally, we were trekking around the wilderness of Israel. So I feel like this relates. I wasn't east of the Jordan. I was west of the Jordan, but I promise you it was sufficient for this glamper. I don't even like camping. I don't sleep in a tent, and I'm backpacking around Israel eating nothing. It was horrible. Right? I'm like, wow, I thought this was going to be a majestic trip to Israel. This is miserable, right? You're going to focus on what I'm doing or you're going to lose your marbles. Literally three days in, I said, what the heck am I doing in this crazy country? And the Lord said, I don't want you to pray one hour a day. He said, I want you to pray all day. He said, I brought you here to teach you how to pray. And I was like, oh, crap. 
this sounds terrible. Now if I go back home, all my friends are going to be like, I thought you were going to Israel for three months. And so I had to stay, right? So me and my brother do it. Thank God for him. We stay. We're trekking around the wilderness. At one point, there's this day. This is one of the defining days of my life. This is literally, I look back on leaps of faith I take now in ministry. This church was, was founded in this quiet place. We're trekking around three days. There was, there was this three-day thing where we walked 50 kilometers, like 55 kilometers. And I had this big backpack on. It's flipping hot. And this one day, it was like the Lord was testing our hearts. And I knew he was testing my heart. And everything that could have got wrong went wrong. I swear we took seven wrong turns. There was one mountain I climbed, went down the wrong way, had to climb back up and then go down the other side. When we got down the other side, realized that my brother hadn't gotten water at the last stop. So we're in the middle of nowhere. It's 95 degrees outside on the side of a road, and we have no water. And I'm like, what the heck is happening? Like, it was like my mind was off. <laughs> it's probably because I wasn't eating. <laughs> so um, we're sitting there, and we look at each other and go, what the heck are we going to do? And this dude pulls up on a bicycle. <laughs> he goes, you thirsty? And we're like, yeah. And he's like, I'll give you water. And we're like, okay. So he pulls out this thing, throws us a water bottle. We're like, that was room service right on the side of the middle of nowhere. And then he goes, where are you going? And we're like, that way. And he's like, no, go this way, turn right. Someone will pick you up and take you where you go. It's like, dude, that dude gave me water. I will listen to him. So, so we start walking. We follow this way for like uh, probably an hour and a half, and then we realize it's a dead end. We're like, crap. This guy just hosed us. Right as we're about to turn around, dude pulls up in a car. Where are you going? Here. Get in. I take you. Like, all right. So, so we get in the car. He takes us off. That leads us to another five miles of trekking around. We finally get to this city, and I, like, we don't have money, by the way. This is why we're kind of, like, homeless in another country. We intentionally siphoned ourselves away. I wanted to be in a place of dependence. We get to this city late at night, and it's a Jewish city. They're not very kind to you, and we were going to try to climb up a hill and sleep on the side of the hill, but about halfway up, I started crying. I said, I can't do this anymore. We're staying at that nice hotel right there. We got all excited. We're like, we we're just going to splurge and spend the money, and we're going to like take a shower, and uh, it's going to be amazing with the bed. So we're all hop scopping all the way down. We walk into the lobby. Hey, we just want to buy. I don't care how much. Just let me buy a room. They're like, no rooms. I was like, what? No rooms. We're like, okay, well, where's the closest hotel where we could get a room? No rooms, all Tiberius. So what? No rooms, all Tiberius. Holiday, sorry. We're like, huh? So, so literally walked out. We were eating, I think we were eating bread only. I had one piece of pita bread left. And it was like our last supper. And we got out there. I started just eating these little pieces. I swear, tears pouring up in my eyes. I'm like, I'm going to sleep on the sidewalk tonight. I've never done this. We don't even have cell phones, honestly. Like, we're, we're hosed. We started going. We had to walk two miles back to the main town. And so we're, like, sitting there on the side of the road. People just blowing by us for, like, 45 minutes. I swear I had a psychotic breakdown. I got on the sidewalk, literally, with my backpack on, and I just sat down. I pulled out my Bible where it said, my soul is like a weaned child within me. And I was like, all I said was, dad, 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 dad. Dad, dad, I'm not joking. Dad, 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 dad. Like, I was like, and my brother's like, okay, Jordan, you need to get up. We're going to walk into Tiberius. And I was like, okay. So, so I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating this. We walk. We walk. And like the whole day, my prayer had been like, Lord, I am hungry for you. My body's aching for food, but I am hungry for you. And Riley's like, Jordan. God's going to provide for us. And literally, I'm just thinking of all the ways that I'm like, dude, what about that patch of grass? What? I'm not exaggerating. I was like, what? He's like, Jordan, there's police. We can't sleep there. And I was like, okay. So we keep walking. And it was just like the Lord was like, you're either going to sit down here and do nothing or you're going to walk and you're going to keep your eyes focused. Look for me. Look for me, son. And Riley said, it just kind of snapped me. I was like, okay. So we're walking. He starts Walking into the different hotels, do you have a room? No room, no room, no room, no room. And I'm sitting on a light pole waiting for him to come out with my backpack again, so I'm leaning like this. And these guys walk up to me. And I've been in Israel for a month at this point. No conversations, really. They're not, they're not very talkative people. I'm sitting on a light pole. These two guys walk up and go, what are you doing? I said, looking for a room. And he's like, why? 
And he's like, what are you doing in Israel? I was like, long story. I was like, I just want a place to sleep. Like, I was just not in the place. And he's like, he's like, wait, so you just, you just backpacking around Israel? And I was like, kind of on a pilgrimage. And I was like, and it's been a long day. And he's like, just, he's like, just, like who are you with? And I was like, my brother. And like, literally, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit washes over my whole body. And I was like, oh God, this is my miracle. And he looks at me and he goes, the Holy Spirit's telling me I need to get you a hotel room right now. And I was like, amen, you're a prophet. <laughs> and literally, my brother comes out, they take our bags, take us to this place. They say, okay, we're going to go back to this place. They come back to this place, they find this hotel, they walk in, they have one room left. They pay for the room, which we didn't have money to pay for it in the first place. And we are literally in the bed and we're like, God just provided. God just provided. And we're like just giddy. And we wake up that morning at like 5 a.m. And I was like, oh, it's a nightmare. Someone's banging on my door. And I'm like, oh, it's a nightmare. They're kicking us out. They didn't really pay. Like, you know, and literally we open the door. They say, we bless you in the name of the Lord. They hand us an envelope. It was for the exact amount of money we had spent the whole first five weeks we were in Israel. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Changed my life. Wrecked me forever. So I had a revelation in that day that the Lord loves, like it is his joy to provide for his children. And I learned a lesson that marked me forever, that he provides. He provides. He is the provider. But that was, you know, in this private place of breaking, my mind was transformed. I can't, I can't describe it to you, but my mind was transformed so that I know, I intuitively know now, when I put myself in these places that feel very vulnerable, I expect him to provide for me. Where before I was terrified. But something happened in the Karith Ravine where I was starving, carrying an overly packed backpack through 50 miles of Israel nothingness to find a city where nobody's talking to me. And God provided. And no one will ever take that from me. People say, oh, you took this leap to build a church. You know why? Because I had a revelation of God as a provider in the Karith Ravine. Amen? We got to go, we got to spend and invest and follow the Lord, and he will orchestrate it. But when we invest and spend time with him and obey his voice, he creates the circumstances conducive to radical mind transformation, and we start having revelation of who is this father of lights, right? Okay, Elijah goes from the Kareth Ravine, and the Lord, finally the, word, the, the brook dries up, and he says, time to leave. And he says, <laughs> he goes from being provided for by ravens, in verse 8, and it says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Okay, that's pretty offensive. He's single. Hey, I got this widow. Now she's going to provide for you. He's like, thanks a lot, God. I think I'd rather have the ravens. That's humbling, right? So it's kind of like, okay, but he hears. This is his provision, a widow. So he arose, he went to Zarephath. He came to the gate of the city, and behold, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called her and said, please get me a little water in a jar, because the brook dried up. He's probably really thirsty, walking through the wilderness, right? Get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called out to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she says, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. If that's any one of us, okay, I heard the word of the Lord wrong. This must not be the right widow. <laughs> Is there a rich widow in this city? Someone with a lot of oil and bread? Because God just told me that there's a widow supposed to provide for me. Because we are so accustomed to focusing on the lack. But you can see the power of the revelation Elijah's had here because he is not even phased by saying, I'm about, like, that is as morbid as it gets. I'm about to die, or this is our last supper, and we are going to die because there's a famine in the land. We have nothing. 
But Elijah was not focused on the lack and was not deterred by the woman's negativity and her poor perspective. He had a word from God, which was his provision, and he knew because he had gone through the breaking of the Kareth Ravine. He had invested in the secret place. He had a revelation that came and transformed his mind, and he knew, I have a word from God, and you're the woman that's going to provide for me. So he says, no, you go, take that oil, take that flour, make it, give me some, and there's going to be enough for you, and it's not going to run out until the famine ends because he's not focused on the lack. He is focused on the provision which comes from the Father of lights who has no lack, no limitation, and he gives and gives and gives because he's a father who provides for his children. Amen? He has the faith to bring increase and multiplication to what God has already given because he was thankful. He knew how to recognize what God was doing. He wasn't deterred by what wasn't happening. Amen? Amen? And that's not it. That's public implication. It went from private implications to public implications. God used him with this widow. But that was just another stepping stone because he had a call on Elijah to change a nation. And it came time for him to go back to this wicked king Ahab. And I'm not going to read the whole story, but he goes on Carmel and the fire falls. And the prophets of Baal Baal are are put away. And and Elijah does this amazing testimony. But then there's there's this story. Right at the end, after the fire falls, the prophets of Baal have been killed. And Elijah is standing. This is in verse chapter 19, verse 41. And Elijah is now standing with Ahab. And you have to realize, Ahab is a powerful man. Okay, imagine if you, were, you felt like God said to go give a prophetic word to the governor tomorrow. How'd you feel? <laughs> oh, me? You sure? <sighs> that sounds scary. Right? Our governor's a really good guy. What if it was like uh, Joseph Stalin? Because that's who we're dealing with here in Ahaz. This is a corrupt, manipulative king who has killed, put people to death, just destroying a nation. He's not a good man. And he's standing with him, and he gets a word. He says, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. He gets his provision. He gets the sound of of a roar of a heavy shower, which is the equivalent. You have to realize this is a land in famine. So this is a land in deep economic depression. This is the equivalent of standing before a mighty king or a ruler or a president or a head of a state or a head of a nation and saying, there is coming a huge economic boom. You better go get ready for it. It's going to happen today. That's like, this is bold. This is not like easy, right? We, sometimes we, we miss how, like, extreme this is. Okay, we would be, like, shaking. I'd be shaking in my boots, like, oh, God, please let the stock exchange go up today. Please, 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 right? You'd be like, okay, I'm really vulnerable right now. Elijah gives this word. You better go up and eat and drink, for I hear the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up and ate and drank, but Elijah went to the top of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth, and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. Mount Carmel is a mountain that juts out into the Mediterranean. So it's right on the edge of the water. It's very beautiful, actually. Um, it kind of looks like a crown. It kinda, and so there's a verse in Song of Solomon, a little side note, uh, it says, you, You're crowned uh, like Carmel. And uh, it's like this crowning mountain that juts out. It's, it's gorgeous. So you're literally sitting there at the edge of of the Mediterranean, and it's the evening offering just happened, so it's probably like towards the end of the day, but you can bright, and it's a bright, cloudless day. He's on top of this mountain. He goes and prays, tells the servant, go up and look. Servant comes back, says, there's nothing. He says, go up and look. Well, there's nothing. It's just a sunny, clear night, Elijah. No, go up and look. Huh? There's nothing. Oh, go up and look again. There's nothing. Seven times. After probably two or three, I'd be pretty discouraged. Oh, crap. I just said there's going to be rain, and there's not even a cloud in the sky. We'd be stressing, freaking out. Okay, God, please bring the rain. Please bring the rain. Please. Okay, go check again. Go check again. That's not the indication we get from Scripture. Because Elijah wasn't consumed once again with what wasn't happening. He was consumed with his provision. I heard the sound of a roar of mighty thunder. So he's there praying, and I would like to think 
that he's there just going deeper and deeper into what he's hearing, what God had given, the sound of a roar of mighty thunder. No, 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 no. Go back, check again. I hear the sound. I don't see anything. No, go back again. I hear the sound. No, go back again. I hear the sound. God, I hear the sound, right? He is consuming himself with what God is doing. Finally, after seven times, servant comes back and says, I see a cloud, but it's like the size of a man's hand, which last time I checked is extremely small. So you're standing on a mountain, looking out over the Mediterranean, and you see a little speck in the sky is basically what he tells Elijah. And this, to me, this just gets me. Elijah stands up and goes, all right, we're good. Looks at Ahab and says, you better get down real quick or you're not going to be able to get off this mountain because the rain's coming. Elijah says, girds up his loins, starts running. That was enough for him because he had had a word. He had heard the sound. He now saw a speck. I'm convinced, man. I know how the kingdom works. I'm so consumed with what God is doing. I don't need proof. I don't need hard evidence. I don't need it to be 100% secure. I heard a sound and I saw a cloud the side of a man's hand and he had the faith to bring it down. And he was a man with a nature like ours. And when he prayed, the heavens opened and it started to rain. There was something in this man that he had the faculty to see the will of heaven come to be. And it wasn't easy. It's backwards. It's an upside down kingdom. But we got to get our minds so transformed to start recognizing what is the provision of heaven. Because I am convinced that there's enough of God in this room that if we all just recognize what he's doing, we'll see the city transformed. I'm convinced. Like there is more than a man's hand in this room. I hear the sound, I see the hand, and if we all start hearing the sound and seeing the hand and start <laughs> thanking God, being so consumed with what he has given already, we will see increase and we'll see the multitudes fed. And we'll see national economies turned. That's kind of a big one, but it sounds cool. Amen? Who wants to pray like that? No more begging God prayers. We don't have to beg him to do his promises. I've, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, so people pray a lot. And I hear this prayer frequently, and every time I'm like, why are you praying that? They say, Lord, I'll pray, pray that you be with him. I'm like, pray that you be with him. He's Emmanuel. Like, he came and died to demonstrate, I'm not going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Like, we don't need to ask him not to leave us. That's his promise. Right? And those are the types of things that as we spend more time in prayer, our minds start being renewed and we start praying differently. Elijah thought different than we do. He prayed different than we do. And as we spend time and invest, it's not about perfect. God is not about perfect. Prayer is not about perfect. Prayer is about progress. And as we get in, we will find, oh, as I start investing, progression Progression, transformation, 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 until pretty soon you can stand and some powerful people give them words, and you're not shaking in your boots. You're just consumed with what God said. Amen? Amen.